Hey guys, welcome to That Pillar Show. Dan here. Mick here. And, and Josh Smith here. Come on! Come on! <laughs> so, wow. many, so many questions. <laughs> I'm happy to be here, man. I'm so excited. Well, I sorry, love you guys, just man. Give we'll, us a second to we'll, get over that. Just, just to get over just that. And moving forward. Get over the fact we've been hoping this was going to happen for a couple yeah, yeah. of years now. But, so, um, thank you so much, mate, for making the time for us. It's right. so cool. I'm so happy to be here, man. I've been waiting for this UK tour for a couple of years, actually, so to finally have the, the ball rolling. Because it was happening at one stage, wasn't it? And yeah. then it got, it's been put back and then, I, yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, I had to cancel when I had yeah. some family stuff going yeah, yeah, on. Yeah. And so this is, yeah, this is truly my first UK tour under my own name. Wow. So it's been, and all the shows have been packed, so it's been really great. Like, that's awesome. super exciting. We're going tonight. We haven't, we haven't been to a show yet. We're going tonight and uh, very excited because uh, touring uh, with Josh is Ariel Posen as well. So, uh, yeah, it's been great. Very nice. Ariel yeah. plays a set, I play a set. That and we play together oh, so kid. there's more than enough for all the guitar people in the audience like <laughs> many notes played all night long <laughs> fantastic awesome oh, we should also just say that josh did an amazing uh, video with our friends at andertons um that went out last week and there's a whole heap of awesome biographical stuff mm. some really good stuff lee did a fantastic job of that it was a really great video so please go and watch that as well uh, to get your full fix of fix of josh yeah, that, w that way we don't have to talk about my childhood learnings now. <laughs> so you picked up the guitar when you were uh, three months old, is that correct? Pretty much. Uh, I got it when I was three. I started playing when I was six, is, is the gist yeah. of it, pretty much. Yeah. Well, that explains a lot, I guess. <laughs> I guess. And where, and where did they put all the extra notes on your guitar? <laughs> I don't know. I have a switch, actually. But no. Um, you know. Something that we're going to get into in a bit, because there's... We had uh, Kirk Fletcher yeah. here before, and he... That's my best friend, <laughs> man, yeah, my brother. Yeah, yeah. Actually, maybe you could give Kirk a honk. <laughs> Kirky poo. <laughs> <laughs> and, and seeing the, the way that he, he approaches, and you guys, are, uh, you approach it quite differently, but yeah. there's, there's definitely a thread Absolutely. that you, you guys have got. And... Um, you know, and he he slayed us. You know, and we're both just in, in awe. And just a couple of seconds of you playing now, we're just going, oh, okay, this is. We need to dive into this a little bit if we can. But first of all, um, I had the great honour of putting this board together for you. Yeah. Um, was that was it last year or the year before? It was last it year. It was last year. It was okay. Music Messer last year. Music Messer last year. Okay, so did this. Um, Cam met you in Germany, mm -hmm. and. Um, We'd been talking about it for a few years. Yes, it's been on the cards for a while. But then uh, Schmidt Array yeah. had built a board that you just went, ah, okay, this is going to work. That was certainly the impetus for this new board was mm. Schmidt, well, Smith, Martin Smith, <laughs> brought the pedal board to, to a show in Germany to right. show me the board. And I was like, this is perfect. The G2 f would fit on the bottom. I could almost fit everything I have on my very big, big Bradshaw board in this little thing that mm -hmm. is brilliant and super heavy duty and then I can put in the overhead of the plane. So it was like, got the ball rolling on, we got to make this board happen, you know? And uh, you kind of knocked it out of the park, man. Oh, dude. Well, things have changed though. Since, as they always as do. As they always do. <laughs> um, this is your new Chula. Yeah, this is, uh, okay. So everybody knows Chula is, is my, th my thing, my yep. main pedal. He did, it's the 10th anniversary this past year of the Chula. Oh, wow. So I guess I, get, I had the idea a little over 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and when I got the first one, I guess it was 10 years ago. And big props to um, Sean Michael from Love Pedal. Uh, I've been a fan of his work since I got my very first hand wide Eternity, which is there. Nice. And um, the white that's the one? one. That's the one. Nice. And it's just, I mean, that was a staple on my board for, for years and the, years. The Eternity was the first pedal he ever sent me. Right. He sent me an Eternity, and I loved it. And then he sent me COT, and it was like, yeah, this yeah. is what I've been waiting for yeah, right. forever. And then I opened it up to change the battery, and it had a I Love In Sync sticker inside, and I knew <laughs> this, this was the guy for me to make my pedals. <laughs> Awesome. And so the, the Chula, now let me get this right. Yes. Is basically this side is your setting mm -hmm. on the on the Church of Tone. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And then this simply adds a, a level of boost 
But is it the same circuit just with the volume up or is it two different circuits? Okay, so no, it's the same exact circuit. Right. The first side is basically preset to here, just below half. Okay. Which was my favorite setting on the Church of Tone. Right. So the second side is a completely separate Church of Tone pedal inside. And we simplify it even further by limiting the range of the knob. So instead of having the full scope of the knob, you just switch, they don't stack. So when I hit right. this, it goes to another COT, this one with the knob. Okay. But we also limited the range. So the knob on this one went all the way down, actually is like halfway up. So even when I, if this is all the way down and I switch to this one, it's like going from there to there. Okay. okay. So no matter what, when I hit that side, it's a boost. It's all right. So it just has half the range on the knob, basically. Okay. Um, we know that uh, you you play Morgans and two rocks, but we yeah. know that your favorite combination of amplifiers is an AC30 and a Super Reverb. We yeah. just happen to have uh, an AC30 and a Super Reverb set up here. Yeah. So if we can, originally, what you first played was just the amplifiers. If we can yeah, the tuler. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, you said AC30, Super, because yep. my two Morgans are basically that. Right. Super, AC30, that's my favorite combo. Here's uh, just the two amps. <laughs> Here's the first side of the chula. have said in their life that they don't understand super reverbs or maybe that they find the tuler a bit bright yeah but anyone who said either of those two things i wish you could be sat where we are sat right now because suddenly it all just falls into place the tuler is a tough one to explain to people and it's the one that i have to answer the most messages from fans about like i bought a tuler and i don't sound like you <laughs> uh, i bought a tuler and it's so bright it, i bought a tuler and it's so loud when I turn it on, the boost is so much, how do you deal with it? And the only way I can explain it to people is this is truly, a, I, and I hate to say it that way, it's truly a gigging man's pedal. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, made yeah, for yeah, loud yeah. amps, yep. maximum dynamics. It's made to be played at a gig. So you don't get it when you play it at one watt in your room. I just want to have it a just, little... It's not the right sound. It doesn't do that. Of a, yeah. of a crowd cheering and... <laughs> Well, as you say, it's an it's an uncomfortable thing to say in a way, isn't it? Because yeah. it, some people might get a little bit offended by that. But what I find super interesting about it is it's got that kind of sizzly thing on the top, which only makes sense when the rest of the amp's really going. Well, yeah, when you're low, it can sound bright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You know, and when the amp doesn't have any headroom, it could sound like it doesn't have any gain at all. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But I can make that enough gain for me 98% of the time when I'm playing through amps loud and wound up at a gig. You know what I mean? It's, it is. It's part of the whole thing of that pedal is pushing the air and having having that. And, and, and my strings are a lot of output. It's, it's all that is making that tone work for me. And it doesn't work for everybody else. But I mean, that's the way gear is, you know? What strings? What strings? What strings are you using? 13 to 58. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Standard. So, in in, Standard in A40. Yeah. We've, uh, we've spent many an hour on that pedal show trying to make everyone feel better about, you know, not using really loud valve amps and <laughs> saying it's okay to use smaller speakers. It is. All of these things are okay. But when you hear this, the difference is Man. Palpable. And it's not just one thing, is it? It's not just strings. It's not just loud amps. No. It's, it's the fact that that works for you. Yeah. Well, there are some things that can't be replaced. Mm -hmm. Air is one of them. You know, I get that question a lot about Stevie Ray's thing. Like, mm. how can I get the Stevie Ray tone with a Princeton reverb and a tube screamer? And I'm like, you can't, man. You got to have so much air pushing on that to get that tone. Mm. And, the, and the strings and the, the, the you got and the, the hardness with which he plays and... It's like that's part of that equation. And now, it doesn't work for everything, you know, but the, the air is a huge part of what I do. And a part of the whole, like the reason I started using switchers in the first place is because 
they I, they preserve dynamics for me when I'm yeah, not yeah, playing yeah. through any pedals. Yeah, yeah. Or when I'm just playing through the ch chula, I'm only going through the chula. Yeah. Because as you can tell, I'm trying to not have compression. Yes. I'm okay. trying to have all that headroom so that whatever I do with my hands, I hear it. Yeah. That, that was one thing that really surprised me about the Anderson's video, actually, when you, when you kind of said compression is not a part of your world live. No, not live. It's an effect. Yeah. In mm -hmm. the studio, I have to use it plenty. Uh, you know, if I'm getting hired to do a certain thing, but live, it just gets in my way. Yeah. It's yeah. Like... But you're separating the sort of pedal compression from the natural yes. compression from the amplifiers working. Yeah, there. I don't want that compression that takes what, what I play lightly and brings it up and yes. takes what I play high yeah. and brings okay. it down to make things smoothed out. Yeah. That's the opposite of what I'm trying to do. Right. I'm trying to, when I play light, be light. Yeah. Okay. And when I play loud, be loud. Yeah, like yeah, I yeah. want all those dynamics yeah. and, and to be in control of that, mm. you know? Yeah. Nuts. Man, that's awesome. That, what, that's the first pedal. Did, you... did we hear the other side of the chula? No. no. So here, I'll, I'll turn the chula all the way down so you can hear the slight, half the slight, of the first pedal. Half, half of the first pedal. So here's the, the, the lowest setting on the sec so second side. So here's first side. Second side. So quite honestly, the second side, I use it twice a night. Right. Okay. When things just, I have to have just a little bit more. You know, most of the time, the first side, when I'm playing loud enough, is, is enough for me. That's my sound. It really is. Like, if you've heard me in the last 10 years, that's the, it's yeah. this guitar, that pedal, two amps, that's my sound. And would, would you have it set down like that? or would you No, have it... I normally have it just about there. Just so it kick you want to hear that? All right. So here's first side again. I'm going to mention it again. That the sizzly stuff on the top, which mm, yeah. is exacerbated by the by the tens in the super, that's really what you need to get above a bass player and drummer, isn't it? It's always when, when you do that, set your amp without that stuff. The band gets loud, and all of a sudden you can't hear anything. Well, here's the thing that I think guys fall in. This, uh, again, this is just my philosophy, but guys fall into the trap of when you were sitting in the room like this. Uh, that's not fat enough. They'll hear something else. This is fatter than that. Yeah, right. Okay, maybe it is. But when you get to the gig, that ne is not necessarily what works. Mm. <laughs> this sounds silly, but it's really important to me that the audience hears everything I play, everything I do. And the that's more. What I'm going wrong. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, the little. So if I do something dynamically. I, uh, that's why I don't want the compression so they it's can hear it. Of, yeah, yeah, but yeah. also, the general tone, if it's so fat, or so dirty, hmm. things get lost in the oh, shuffle out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. This my, this tone, I know that everyone out there is hearing what I'm doing all the time. Mm -hmm. Because if everybody in the band has the fattest tone of all time, no one gets heard. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. And how does that that clarity and that that a level of dynamics? Because you've been playing with that sound for so long, how does yeah. that inform what you're playing? Because what I find, yeah. if you've got so much gain and so much compression. So much of it's fluff, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. Or you can fluff so much, but what? But when I hear you play, it's like the detail yeah. in, in what you're playing. It's it's amazing. It certainly forces you to get better, right? And be more precise you without can't, question. Yeah, because you can't stuff up with that sort of a sound. No, and that's also another reason I like the strings. It, yeah, I have right. to use if when I play these strings. There's no phoning it in. Yeah, it's right. like you've got to play hard. You know what I mean? It's impossible to phone it in. I can't do it. They won't react if I just 
half has it. You know mm. what I mean? I can't, I can't believe I'm going to ask this. Can I? Would you mind if I just? Yeah, I haven't played a guitar with thirteens since I was trying to be Stevie Ray Vaughan. <laughs> we all been there. And I'm kind of. I'm interested in what a, a tone bend feels like. Sorry, I need to. You have to. You know what's interesting? When I hear somebody else play my guitar, and Kirk says it all the time when he plays my guitar, when you're not used to them, the brightness doesn't come out when you're playing. And then when I play it, all the top comes back. That's exactly what I was going to say. You go on, play. Just one more thing, because yeah. I'm gonna try. Give me some Albert King, Come on, man. Yeah, that, that's not gonna happen. I just don't have it. And and you better have that back. Um, yeah. That's astonishing. It was just and just here now, you, you're playing. Yeah. It. Like life, yeah. You get what you put into it. That's yeah. astonishing. Yeah. Wow. I'm going to. It is. It. it <laughs> there's going to be pauses during this yeah, while yeah, I yeah. while I gather Just, myself together. Yeah. You know, it's um. Yeah. Perfect example. Perfect example is that is that when you get the guitar set up and 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 with that sort of um, you know heavy strings. With someone who can really do it. It's what works for you. Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. what works for you. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I play for someone who I would, cons I mean, you know, this sounds terrible too. Some for, I consider I have pretty precise touch mm. and playing, but I do play heavy yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, and not, yeah. you know, not completely ham handed, but I do lay into it, you know, and I'm not super delicate and, and all that. So, but it works, you know, for me, it's just part of what, like I said, the whole thing, it's the whole, I see it as the, the overall, it's like, it's the reason I like this pickup and mm. the reason I like the Chula and the reason I like amps without master volumes. It's all part of trying to get that tone. You know. What I mean? When did you arrive at this sound? Super and AC? Uh, well, the Super was first, for right. sure. Once you find the Super, it's like, especially for guys like myself and Kirk, it's like, it's something special about a super reverb. Mm. There's something special about basements too, about fender amps with four speakers at mm -hmm. two ohms. Mm. There's a magic thing that happens yep. in that cabinet. And the super is just the perfect club level volume amp right. where you have the headroom, but it, it's not sterile like a twin. Mm. It gives you a little character. You know what I mean? It takes pedals, of course, amazingly. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, that was the first amp that I found that was like, this is, you know, the volume level mm -hmm. and the, the, the stiffness and the headroom that I was looking for without being too stiff. The AC30 came from when I moved to L.A. and started doing sessions, I first started trying other amps, you know what I mean? Because up until then, I was only concerned with getting my tone. So when I moved to L.A., I had to get other tones, you right. know. And so I had to learn about them first. Mm. And then I started to realize, oh, I like some of this, and I like some of this, and the AC30 I liked. But the combination together was a lark. I basically, I had tried the Super and a Marshall together. I tried a Marshall and a Vox once together, but never the Super and the, and the Vox. And we were flying somewhere for a gig probably 15 years ago. So it was backline situation. And the tour manager said, well, what do you want for backline? It's a festival one-off. I said, give me a Super and an AC30. And he said, Okay. And man, the second I plugged those two amps in, it was again like this is I was missing. This is it. Wow. Like they fill in one fills in where the other one stops. Right. You know what I mean? They just do something. And especially when you put a pedal on in front of two, the both of them, mm -hmm. they both react and like a, a Vox takes it totally yep. different yep. than Absolutely. a Fender does. Yep. And it makes things so wide. You know. 
that's that's kind of how I hit on that, just by accident. Awesome, awesome. Uh, right, I think we're. Let's just keep going all day. I yeah, think, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is too good. Right. So, what do we have next then? Um, well. Are we going in signal order or just whatever? whatever. Just whatever. Okay, because technically the octave is the first pedal in the chain. Okay. So, but let's for intensive purposes, here's the fuzz. So, BOG fuzz by Deep Trip. And it's, now, this is really interesting. When I tried this and I got one and I, I really worked hard trying to find the, a fuzz sound, but what I'm thinking is a fuzz sound is this massive, all-encompassing, it's fuzz face, rah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when I heard you play it, you're not dialing the the mm -hmm. fuzz. You're using it almost like a filtery type thing. I mean, it's still definitely fuzzy, but it's it, not it, yeah. not not in the not in the um, Hendrix. You know, it's a big screaming fuzzy with this type guitar. Thing. No, with the right. Strat, it's a little more okay along those lines. The thing I look for in a fuzz. So here's my fuzz story. Basically, I have a. Vintage gray one with right. NKT 275 in okay. it. It's great, mm -hmm. but it sounds different if I move it two inches on the floor. Yeah, right. And it certainly sounds different if I try to travel with it or whatever. Right. Um, so I went through just tons of fuzzes trying mm -hmm. to find the one that was right for me. And the Burkos was the first one that I got that mm -hmm. was like, right. this is the right, this is killing. Mm -hmm. And I, I still, it's on my other board, you know, and mm -hmm. I've used it for quite a long time now. The only thing the Burkos doesn't do is... It's not really above unity like most fuzz faces. Okay. So I'm and and this is in combination because I use the chula so much mm. and it's so loud. When I turn it off, every other pedal sounds quieter than the chula. Right. Okay. But I don't necessarily always want to stack. So yeah, it's yeah. like I wanted a fuzz that would keep up with the chula. Right. Basically. And when I tried this one, it gave me that. It had a a volume way above unity if you mm -hmm. wanted it. And as far as the character of the fuzz, I do. I like a fuzz face, but not with the gain all the way up. Right. And I like yeah, yeah. just this much spittiness. Okay. You know what I mean? Which is part of what I'm trying to dial in with that new Vemoram fuzz that mm -hmm. I've made with those guys, which is a little more different and unique than this. But So basically, yeah, this is kind of the way I approach it. It's still a fuzz face for sure. That's right. But with a telly, it kind of gets its own thing happening. Mm. So here's, again, straight in. I'm going to put slap back from the TC. And here's with the BOG. worked out why you didn't like, like it quite so much because I can't see that well no 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 but but that is adding I'm, I'm just listening to those tens really sizzle on top oh, of yeah. Yeah, all yeah, of yeah, that. yeah 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 and that's really adding to the whole yeah oh, man, see just, and that makes it sound fuzzier yeah well, absolutely is, is my that, point. so in this context yeah. with those two amplifiers like that it's like oh, okay yeah. totally totally get it because unless you've got a fuzz that can put out that much output, it is going to sound quieter in amplifiers that are already working. Yep. Very cool. But it's you're a, still getting the detail. Because you don't have the fuzz cranked up, you're still getting the detail. Yeah, well, the that's, yeah, again, I, I, I would be, I, it wouldn't work for me if I didn't. I have to have that. Yeah. I got to have the clarity, even when it's thick like yeah, that. Yeah. I got to hear the notes and hear, even if I play dynamically, I have to be able to hear the change in the way I uh, pick something or yeah, something. Yeah, okay. So that's, uh, you know, what I look for. And I really like that pedal. The only difference between, it, it's mo it's far more versatile than the Burkos. Like, it has the high and the low mm -hmm. controls. Mm -hmm. There's some other sounds in there that are really cool that I quite frankly don't use because I found the sound that I like in yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. But 
The only thing it doesn't do, because it's got all that stuff and because of the volume, I think, is it doesn't quite clean up like a vintage fuzz face, uh, okay. which is okay for me because I only use it in certain songs and sure. mostly for blowing. Right. But like the Burkos cleans up better, okay. you know. Yeah, Actually, yeah. I think Dew is trying to make me one that, that will split the difference. Right. Because what's funny is the Burkos, he modded a Burkos that I could try to make it louder, and then it didn't sound anything like itself again. Oh, wow. So it was yeah, like yeah. it's hard to find this fuzz that ticks all the boxes. Yeah. Fuzz is the most particular fuzz. To it the person sure of any pedal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know I mean? yeah. 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 Duelist, then. So, Jesse. Can we switch to the Strat, then? Yeah. All right. You're, you're in charge. <laughs> it's a Strat only pedal. <laughs> uh, okay. No, I really, I only use it with the Strat, the Duelist. Um, Jesse makes killer stuff. I have his fuzz, too, that I really like. It's a germanium one, and it's, it's much like my vintage one. It's very temperamental. Right. But it sounds killer. What's yes, this? sir. This is a copy of a 57 Strat that is made by a friend of oh, mine. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that, that, I was trying to place it, and I was like, it's, that is, it's not. It's not a real one, no. But it's, yeah. It's a real good one, then. <laughs> so, uh, the Duelist has two sides. I don't even use the heavy hand side, which is like the Marshall Bluesbreaker side. Yeah, right. Uh, obviously the string singer is the tube screamer side and it has glass fat and stock to me glass sounds like TS 10 which you know is my favorite tube screamer mm -hmm. sound so that's what I'm going for with this and if you'll notice here's another good thing like the Chula has no volume but you'll notice most pedals like this volume completely dimed get rid of compression <laughs> <laughs> the more I hang around with this guy the more I like him <laughs> so here's straight in I don't even care if I get kicked out. This is just awesome. Take everything you thought you believed as a 15 year old boy, put it in a bag, kick it all around a car park and just hand it back to you. Honestly, so you just play change it at the end there. And, yeah. some, and the, the big bend in Texas flood and all of that. God, I just, I was trying so hard to get anywhere near that as a kid and I did not understand it at all. Mm come to understand it a little bit better as time goes on, but then sure. to actually hear it handed to you, it's like, yeah, okay, you've got to do it properly. Yeah. Man, it's, there's no shortcuts to that tone, unfortunately. You know what I mean? It's like, and I'm not, you're talking, when I was 15, I could have played every note of that note for note, every song he ever did. It was all, that was my life. You know what I mean? I'm out of practice on it. <laughs> but since I've got that pedal, it's certainly pushed me back into that, it went wanting to play a strat more, enjoying that tone again more. But what's interesting about that is, and I found, I was talking to a guy, I was doing an interview this morning for the Guitarist magazine, and he was asking me, you know, why the telly and not the strat? And I said, on the telly, I'm me. Yeah. I don't think at all when I play that guitar. Right, wow. The second I pick this up guitar, it's in my head is Stevie Ray, Jimi Hendrix, David yeah, Gilmore. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like, it, it's just, it, it's unavoidable. It pops in my head. Mm. When I pick up a 335, the first thing I'm thinking is Larry Carlton and B.B. King. You know, when I pick up that guitar, I'm thinking nothing, which means I'm being me, you know. So that's why I still tend to stay with that most of the time. But there's something incredibly exhilarating about this sound that is nice sometimes. No yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, 13's on there. Yeah. Oh, and this is vintage radius, so this is 725. This is straight up 57 Strat style, so it's got, I like the V-necks. Uh, 
I use the same frets on every guitar, Stumac number 154, which is in between 6150 and 6105. Oh, I think Stumac's they're, just sold out of those frets. They're <laughs> taller, but not as wide. Not as wide. I like yeah, them yeah, tall. Yeah. I like a crown, like a hard crown, because I like precise intonation. Yeah. Come on, have a good look. This one feels stiffer than the telly, so I keep the action higher on this one. Yeah, they are nice frets. Oh, my God. If you could see what I'm seeing now, you'd see... A fair gap between the fretboard and the yeah. low E strat. I like to, the strat, when I'm doing yeah. that, I want to mm. fight it even more. I've always said I, I can't bend strings on a lacquered a maple lacquered board. Yeah. No? Well, no. <laughs> Half a song, yeah. I reckon. Yeah, but you give it a month and you'd be you. good. Give it okay. a month and you'd be good. You reckon? Yeah. You get used to it. You know, it's like going to the gym and you, at first you can run, you know, six feet, and then in a couple months you can run a few miles. You even get half a song in this is <laughs> but doesn't it sound unbelievable it, yeah and it's the sound that pushes you yeah, forward yeah. with that that's amazing absolutely apologies amazing. to anyone who thinks we're being ass kissy or over effusive today that's just the you way just, it is yeah, i'm afraid yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> here real quick I'll, I'll give you the the difference with the uh, fuzz with the strat because it, it is it's kind of like a different animal with the with the telly it gets real s smooth and less fuzzy you know what i mean with the strat i'll use the echo rick with it It's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Yeah. The, there's something about, you know, we sit in here quite often with, with quite a quite a high sound pressure level going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not, I've not been affected like that. It's, yeah. it's amazing. It's not painful. N not at all. It's really loud, but there's not uncomfortable in the slightest. There's no frequency there that I'm going... And I'm really sensitive you to that stuff. Sensitive to that, yeah. But, and, it's, but it's not lacking top end either. Not at all. No, no, no. 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 Mm. Well, That's important to me. Top end is not an enemy. Yeah, like yeah, there's yeah, certain yeah. kinds of top end that you know. Yeah, it's like ow. But you learn how to to dial in your tone like that. Like I said, so that you cut through the mix. Mm. You know. It's, it's almost like when you when the amp's working, then everything else is breathing. So you've got all the bass in the mid to support it. Mm -hmm. And it it definitely feels like that. Whereas, anyway. Well, a lot of guys on a Super, I'll see, you know, they crank the mids up and stuff. And if you'll see, I've got mids on like four or three and a half. Yeah. But the volume, when you get the volume up, it's that's enough. You know right. what I mean? It's like... It, yeah, uh, it, just for context there. So the Super is set volume four, treble three, a uh, little over three, middle four, bass almost yeah. four, reverb just over three. So... Yeah. At the gig, it would be volume six, treble five, probably, and middle and bass the way it is. Yeah. Six is the magic number on the Super Avery. Yeah, everyone says that, don't For they? certain. So. Well, I'm just, I'm, I'm pleased you've experienced this Fender Super Amp. <laughs> <laughs> it gets short shrift from me, I'm afraid. Right. Next. Uh, where are we? With Duelist we've done. You mentioned an octave earlier. Yeah, on. so the love pedal, believe, is under Underneath. the... Underneath. Uh, Do you mind if I flip of the... Of course, uh, flip it up. Flip the lid. Oh, look at that. Ooh. Nice. Uh, another shout out to Martin at Schmidt Array. He does make a lovely board, doesn't he? He does make a lovely board. 
I love it, man. And the looks that I get on the airport, I like too. I want to get a, a pair of handcuffs to go between the handle and my wrist, so it looks like I'm carrying the, <laughs> the nuclear the nuclear, codes. the nuclear codes. Yeah, because it's always like, what is that? You know, it's, n- it's not the nuclear code, sir. It's just my very special George Formby girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or typewriter. I get typewriter a lot. Okay, the octave is the believe that yep. pink thing that has no knobs. Um, Mixed I'm, favorite sort of pedal. Yep. Pink. No, no knobs. Oh, octave. Oh, well, no, no knobs. Pink that's, as well. Why not? That's what I love. I, you know, that's why I like the chula too. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. There is a theme, you know. <laughs> but um, I like to believe, as I've said before, I guess because it's kind of like the Green Ringer, and it's it's clean for an octave, and that way I can combine it with all the other things to get different. So I can get the Octavia sound mm. if I want it, but just straight. <laughs> It has its own thing, which I like. below the 10th fret you know what i mean yeah right and it, and i could play bridge pickup and it's not overly bright it, it sounds almost synthy that sounds like the old um coral sitar yeah thing i use it actually sometimes on sessions to get that sound yeah, like i play wow. with this guy rafael sadiq and he had a song called Ooh, girl, that was like a uh, Delphonics type yeah. thing. But then there was a line that was a sitar thing, so live I would play it. That's really cool. That's it's amazing how, cool. how, how many uh, kind of soul tunes that the, the, the old coral thing was on oh tons and tons of stuff yeah Yeah. so then i i hit it with stuff so it's like if i hit that with the chula if i hit it with the fuzz it's way more uh, Octavia. I can get the the combinations uh, with that octave pedal. It's really you know. That's really cool. The way it, it kind of reacts differently. Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, like check it out with the. Like, I'd never use the Duelist with the telly, but the Duelist with the octave is its own thing, too. Like, yeah, blimey, blimey, <laughs> good pedal. It's a good pedal. Sean made, uh, the, I have one of the very first ones that was just silver, no knobs, and I loved it right away when I when I got it. Sean, the thing about Sean is that in today's day and age, with all these people making these pedals that are so sexy and complicated, Sean has these. Uh, so, absolutely, I was going to say that. He's, he's a great player. He's a player, and that's why, for some reason, everything he sent me, it just works for yeah. me. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? I'm, I'm the same. I, I heard when I first got my um, Eternity, there was a really old clip, and it's just an audio clip of him demoing the Eternity to a, mm. uh, someone. It's like the playing was just beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Um, but he's, yeah, he's, he's got, for a designer, his mm. ears are exceptional. So yeah, big big fan. Yeah, me too. I mean, it's you're talking yeah about twelve years I've been using his stuff now. Okay. Awesome. Uh, 
all this left, I mean, you heard the echo wreck a little bit. Yeah, the, the I want to talk about your use of delays. Yeah. Because um, yeah. we, we touched base, um, we had... Um, uh, Give us a clue. We had... Uh, any clue, any we kind had, of clue? We had Matt's go for it. Oh, Matt, yeah. <laughs> and he was showing us, he had this really Where's cool use. Horn, Matt, Where's sorry, Matt. <laughs> Uh, and he was showing us how he uses the delays. He had this slapback thing, and it's a bit similar to to yours. Yeah. Um, now this is a tone print that you did with Tor. I did this with Tor. Yeah. So on the flashback, I have two sounds. I did a tone print called the double slap. That's for you, Tor. Tor. Yeah. Who rules? Um, so basically, I use two different slaps, but right. mostly I leave it on this slap. So here's none. It's quite up there. Quite, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's actually a little loud at the moment. Let me turn it down. Uh, and is this the one people can download from the... Absolutely. So if you, have a t if you have a tone print enabled flashback, you can go to the TC site and download this uh, for free. So like... That with the chula is like... much my tone basically oh. so the cool thing about the tone print though that's a track off josh's uh most recent solo record yes. called pusher B yeah pusher. is that the one that joe bonamassa plays on as well no, he plays on the record yes yeah uh, over your head he plays on that's yeah. the record and the song called pusher yeah so yeah. check that out as well so what's cool is when we dialed this in you know tor is able to do it with the editor so mm -hmm. it's fancy and all that so we're, we're shifting, as I turn the delay, that's the delay knob all the way up, is that longer slap, even though it's very short. If I turn the delay knob all the way the other way, it gives me a different slap, a much quicker one, but with some repeats on it. And also we added ducking, like from oh, a 2290. Wow. So that's this one. Kind of the Robin thing, to be honest. Do you want if I just hear that without reverb of for course. a second, just so, I can, so it's my kind brain of a, can separate the two well, things? Well, it's kind of a verb. Like So two, I've got two, that's why it's double slap. It's like a two slap backs. That's, that's very cool. I turned fantastic. the reverb obviously part, yeah, way, part way through that so you could, you could hear. So those are the two sounds I use in the flashback. I tend to like delays that get out of my way. Okay. I don't like ones that just take over my tone when I'm playing. I like when they sneak in when I stop playing and um, when, you know. And what's the... You know, what, what's the uh, characteristic of, of a delay that would get out of your way? What are you... Ducking. Like the TC. That's okay. why I always like the 2290. Right. Because it ducks back when you play. And then, okay. it, then it comes back up. And it, it's like it reacts to your playing, you know, in a way. So I try to find delays that just don't step all over. Mm. Like the, I like the Echo Rec because it's incredibly vibey, but it also just doesn't step all over your thing. So the Echo Rec is like my vibey delay. Mm. You know, okay. when I just need this. There's a really interesting thing about the echo rack repeats is the lack of bottom end. Simon repeats. and I were talking about that this morning. Right. That exact thing. Right. And it doesn't, you don't get that, the, it, it can mush all those bottom end frequencies together. Mm -hmm. But because that's shelved somewhere, you're just getting this, this lovely echo that's right in the perfect frequency that doesn't muck things up. So you can actually have quite a lot of effect from yeah. an echo rack style delay without it getting too muddy. 
Well, what's nice is if I tone it all the way down and go fuzz instead of chula, it does do the, the woof though, if you want it. <laughs> But, but the other side of the spectrum is it does so nicely the bright where it's like. So yeah, my whole delay thing is I like to have the slap that's available at all times. Mm -hmm. That one little light, slightly longer one with a few repeats for epic moments and prettiness. <laughs> and then the rest are just all from the H9. And they're very song or part specific. Okay, so let's talk about the H9 because you you're a fan of the H9. Huge. I've I have struggled with the H9. Right. But I know, um, like I first heard Guthrie Govan use this one. I did board for him with, with Stephen Wilson, and and he had a a twelve string preset in there, mm -hmm. and he sounded fantastic on it. Yeah. And I couldn't make the bloody thing work. I just couldn't do it. But I think, but there's a thing, there's a, um, very much like yourself, there's an, uh, there's an accuracy and an articulation in his playing that maybe favours, maybe works well with that sort of thing. I, I don't know. But whenever I hear you use this, I'm thinking, it sounds awesome. Yeah. The thing about the H9, and, and I've found Eventide pedals in general since right. I started using, which I've been using Eventide quite a while. I used to have an Eclipse mm -hmm. rack unit. Yep. I had a time factor and a mod factor. The thing that the Eventide does for me is it's it's just a very pro unit. It never breaks. It right. sounds super solid. Mm. And it's a true, everything they make is true stereo. Right, so okay. if, with two amps... Everything I pull up on this pedal, I can have something different going to A and B if I want. You know what I mean? Okay. So it's like there's not a lot of pedals that do that. No. You know? There's something that give you a dry output on one side and a wet output on yeah. the other. But yeah. Well, yeah. like take the timeline. It's a stereo pedal, of course, but there's only one true stereo delay sound the in that hole. pedal. Yeah, yeah. The rest just duplicates to both outputs. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's like this. If I load a reverb delay thing in one, I can... Or a delay. Like I can load the entire edge delay... In this, I can literally have a quarter note going to one amp and a dotted eighth note going to the second amp from one thing. Right. You know what I mean? So I like that. Mm. The other thing about this pedal specifically that is so important to me is it's the ultimate session pedal. Right. Because it has everything in it, every sound. They're all high quality, and I can control it with my iPad. So it sits on my music stand, and I'm not bending down. Yeah. I'm not turning around to a rack. It's just sitting here, and anything somebody asks me to get, I have it. Yeah, yeah. And it's really easy for me to get to it, you know what I mean? And I guess as a session player, and that's a really important thing, that you know that pedal inside out, right? Absolutely. And you can go in there in a session, and someone says, look, I, I, need, a, you know, I need a really bright flange on mm -hmm. this part and you can they, go in there and go bang and it's there they probably Very don't easy. say that do they probably say i need it to sound a bit trippy and spacey yes of course yeah, you got to interpret right. language yeah. you know uh of, of producer speak i guess but yeah it gives me the ability to always have something else on tap if so if what you do first doesn't work give me another idea give me another idea i've right. got a million ideas yeah. just in that pedal yeah and then in my world well like tonight when i play my gig there's you know, I'll probably use 10 sounds from it over the course of the night. And wow. because of the G2 and the switcher, I mean, that's super easy for me. Mm. to. I hit a preset and it switches that and it, I'm, I'm in my game. It's, you know, part and parcel to a part of a song or something. So a lot of the stuff in the H9 that's actually in presets is stuff that relate to parts of my songs. Right. Yeah. But you, I mean, you're not just pulling out factory presets you go in there no, and you no, edit no. everything there, i don't use any factory yeah, presets. Right, right. yeah okay well it's like you made me here this button top left button number eight mm -hmm. we made that the dedicated leslie button mm -hmm. on every bank of this g2 mm -hmm. so when i step on this button it's like i stepped on a dedicated leslie pedal basically right no matter what the h9's on previous to stepping on that button it's it switches the h9 to the leslie, leslie. sound okay. and turns it on right so it's like What's funny is I had guys 
ask me like to write down every setting from this pedal because like I can't get this Leslie sound out of my H9. Mm. How do you get that sound? And I'm like, well, a big part of it is the stereo. Yeah. With the two amps, yeah. you know? And I can set, actually you can like set the dirtness of the horn to one and not the other. And like, so I've tweaked that Leslie a lot, wow. you know, to get the one that I like as my just go to need a Leslie sound. So for anyone who's not following, um, the even sides controlled by MIDI and out of that side of G2, there's a MIDI port. That plugs into H9. When Josh steps on a, a G2 preset, it's pre-programmed to know which MIDI change to make, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. Like tonight. I need to be careful. I'm talking about MIDI, but the second song of the night tonight. So basically, when I'm starting a gig, I hit preset one. That's my blank. Nothing. You know what I mean? And you see, it switched the H9 to something. Mm -hmm. Just as that's like my default H9, which is kind of the same slap as the second slap in the flashback. Right. I just like to have that in my H9 whenever I can turn on the H9 and have that. Whatever. Okay. So if, when I hit the way I set up the G2, I've got all my instant accesses on the right, and I've got the Leslie button and the H9 hot switch. Mm -hmm. That's the same on every page. Mm -hmm. And then I made these three buttons preset one through four. So for the eight banks, I only have four, four presets, presets to okay. each one. Right. And I think of them mostly as songs, but because there's only eight banks, I have to sometimes delineate like there's, well, there's one extra preset in this bank that's something else, you know, okay, sure, because sure. there's only eight. But so like tonight, we'll get to the second song and I'll go bam. And there it switched, says how long, that's the main sound from how long. And it also it switched on the H9 and it switched on the BOG. Then I'll hit this and it switched to a different patch. It says how long Leslie, which is the bridge of how long. That's how I use it. I think of it in terms of song. So normally I'll have a preset that's verse, chorus, bridge if I need it. Mm -hmm. That's how I program the G2 and all switchers for that matter of fact. What is H9 hot? H9 hot is different no matter what sound you're on. It could be anything, which is really awesome. So like, let's say I turn the Leslie back on, right? On that mm -hmm. sound, Leslie number nine, I programmed the hot button to be break. But on other sounds, it could be anything. What's cool is on the iPad, you can make it not just like um, a, a foot switch type function, it can turn knobs. Yeah, yeah. So if you hold down the hot switch, you can turn the feedback way up and turn uh, the time up and then it'll save that. And then when I hit the hot switch, it'll do what you just did. So it'll then it'll, all of a sudden it'll turn the feedback to where you turned it when, and the speed maybe it'll change, it'll do anything. <laughs> the hot switch is completely preset dependent. Man. That's what they call it, the hot switch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. expression yeah. control. Yeah, sorry, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, well, it's, you know, there's this sound that's happening and it's amazing. I want to get into some questions about playing. Okay. Because um, I, can't, I can't have him here and not say, <laughs> how do you do this, Josh? <laughs> yeah, um, we, we, we're hoping that Josh can maybe teach us something and uh, you guys as well so that we all benefit from this exchange I could try one thing I've always wanted to know and that you do awesomely is that there's this um, it's like a Eric Johnson Joe Bonamassa group of five things yeah, yeah right and I see you pull that out from time to time and I've never <laughs> never been able to work out I can I can do groups of five but there's you do it with such it just sounds awesome and how I just and it, I don't know if you're doing a your I am hybrid picking it for sure. Yeah. Okay, all right. So that's the difference between the way I do it and those guys do it. Right. For certain. Um, yeah, it's all Eric Johnson, 100%. You know? Right. Uh, that just comes from, once you learn your pentatonic boxes mm -hmm. all up and down the neck, you start to fall into those patterns, you know, and listening to him play that stuff, it's unavoidable that some of that would creep in. And, yeah, it's mostly 
I play it kind of like this. So if we're in A, I, if say we're down in this position, mm -hmm. I'll play it. But th this is the way I'll really play with the hybrid. I love that. So Dan, you exclaimed, you exclaimed it. You uh, explained it as groups of five. Is that accurate? Is that what was going on? Yeah, there? it's like. Yeah. So in practice, do you play the five and then go back to one before, or uh, I'm trying it's to. It's groups of five notes. It's like five. Uh, so, but what Eric did in that grouping is he kind of goes back one note every time he starts the next phrase. So it's yep. like. Instead of just going. You know what I mean? But the grouping of five gives it that just kind of rep that thing that it, it's like you it's like you play it through and then it restarts itself kind of, you know? And that's a lot of a big key to him and Joe and Eric Gales and what those guys do. You Did know? your right hand just naturally fall into a into a picking stuff of that? No, well the hybrid thing for me was completely separate from that. Like I I started hybrid picking because of Danny Gatton, right. like because I heard him and to play those things and some of those country techniques you have to, it's nowhere, you either use banjo picks or mm. you hybrid pick mm. that thing. So that's kind of how that evolved. And next thing I knew, playing those fast blues runs became, I just was playing them that way instead right. okay. of, instead of, you know, yeah, okay. up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. That just disappeared from my playing. Right. I used to play like this, just anchored to the board and... Okay. But it's so uncomfortable for me now. Like the old cliche blues lick of... Like I used to be able to do that just screaming fast like that. And I can't, but if I do it like this... You know what I mean? It became... It changed overnight, like right. all that, once I started the hybrid picking thing. Okay. okay, so we've got one thing. We've got a five note pattern where you... Uh, start on the fourth essentially so you do five and then you go back one and then you yes the fourth note in the sequence yes yeah. you're right yeah, yeah. yeah so we so you can you can practice that it's a straight minor, minor pentatonic scale yep so you can practice that is there something we could divulge about hybrid picking just maybe a little exercise or something that you could pass on yeah the way i started working on the hybrid thing was in triplets normally yeah i find that i do a lot of two down strokes and then up with my middle finger so I'm doing a lot of... Like that's how it started for me. So that. you're not you're not using those two, you're using no, I, one. I, I do use two only if I'm playing double stops. But, but normally if I'm just blowing, it's just middle finger. But see, I automatically switched yeah, 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 when yeah, I went yeah, to yeah. grab two more than two strings. You know what I mean? That just comes like that's completely natural. Everybody does that differently. You know, what and I, mean? I guess like anything, it, when you first start doing it, it feels like the most unnatural thing in the world. And then yeah. when you've put twenty-five hours into it, all of a sudden, well, it was this lick. This was the lick. I couldn't play that lick. It just doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound like a banjo. So that's how I have started getting it. That was, that was the lick that started it, was that, you know? And next thing I knew it just became, even when I'm playing blues rhythm or whatever, I'm playing like this, like stabbing, like a piano player almost. became the way I, I started to play everything. Yeah. 
Okay. Awesome. I've got... Uh, down, down, pick, down, down, pick. Down, down, pick, down, down, down pick. Down, down, pick, down, down, pick. Just I, as an I would sit on the couch effect. and just go... As I watch basketball, I would just sit on the couch and do that over and down, over and over. Down, down, pick. Down, down, pick. No, down, down, finger. Uh, sorry, that's what I mean. Down, yeah. down, finger. Pick, pick, yeah. finger. Yeah, pick, yeah. pick, pick, finger. finger. Now yeah. we're just confusing the matter. <laughs> uh, have you ever seen the bluegrass technique? Down, down, up. Yeah. Can't do it. Nah. But it's similar. You yeah. Know. Guy called Brad Davis. Check him out. Down, down, up. Down, down, up. It's yeah. insane. Anyway. Yeah. One feature of yours uh, and in Matt's and, and uh, Kirk's and, you know, lots of the awesome guys is the way that you approach changes yeah um if you how does someone start doing that are you going to talk about two five you're going to talk about two five we can talk about we can talk about if two fives to. yeah yeah so well, it, does that because i for me that was the thing that unlocked changes a, a little bit more than well, but sure don't, yeah don't yeah, let yeah, me, yeah. Don't let me just, derail you yeah yeah well but the thing two fives absolutely don't. Is that the best place? If someone is used to playing, you know, lots of guys have got their pentatonics down. Yeah. How do you go from that to being able to nail the changes? This is how you do it, okay? To me, the biggest difference between a rock guy and a jazz guy is this. The hair. <laughs> the number of people at the gigs. Yeah, well, definitely <laughs> the number of people at the gigs. But a rock guy has no problem playing... All over the changes. Yeah. When Steve Vai's playing, he's very melodic, and when a chord happens, he knows just what to play over that chord. But he doesn't necessarily play through them the way a jazz musician does. A jazz guy connects chords in a certain way. Right. He so you can play all these amazing things over this chord and over this chord, but to get from there to there, you have to do something that makes the solo speak and not start and stop and not sound like you're changing keys when the next chord comes up. And that's the difference between a jazz guy. And the way you do that is basically, for me, threefold. You do chromatic lead connect chords together. You use things like diminished and augmented chords, which literally solely exist to create tension from one chord to another mm -hmm. chord. Mm -hmm. And then you use turnarounds, like two five ones. So those are the three things that started enabling me to not just play over changes because you have to there's no shortcut to learning what to play over each chord mm -hmm. you just have to know what's in each chord you know your and know what and... works over each not just arpeggios you got to know what intervals are in that chord and yeah, what okay. scales so, and, yeah. and tones work on that chord mm -hmm. so that you can highlight them you can't shortcut that mm -hmm. but what you can work on is the way to once 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 you figure that out you can work on the ways to connect them together so in a blues setting that's not so difficult because you know the chords already mm -hmm. that are happening. So you got to focus on how to connect them together. And the way I did that was absolutely like this, by having an old dude show me these three things. He said, play rhythm for me. And I went... And when I did that, he stopped me. And he said, what'd you just do? And I said, I played this little half step to get down to the four. And he said, why don't you ever play that in your solo? <laughs> and I didn't understand what he meant. And he goes, all you're doing there in your rhythm is connecting, uh, finding a way to go from your one to your four with something. Do it in your solo. And I said, show me. And he went, I think I understand. Then he played it backwards. He went, and I realized he was just playing. And it was a big light bulb, like, that's it? And he said, yeah, that's it. I said, okay, what's next? And he said, well, what chord are you on? And I said, the four. And he goes, well, what do you do when you play rhythm on the four? So I went. And it was like, I didn't even know what diminish was, but I had learned that shape. And he said, why don't you ever play that in your solo? And I said, I don't know how. So he went something as simple as. And it was again, it was like light bulb of, that's all you're doing is spelling out those in-between chords to get from one to the next. And it's creating this tension that when you get to the next chord, it's like you arrived. And that's what music is, you know, especially improvising. So I was like, what else, what else? And he goes, well, also on the four, you ever heard like a Beatles song or a Ray Charles song where they go,
from four to four minor. And I said, yeah, of course I've heard that before. And he goes, well, check this out. Fathead Newman, who played with Ray Charles, he had a solo that went like this. God, that's I I can do that even if the rest of the band doesn't do that and he goes of course try it so I go and I was like holy sh crap you know like I, I I get it what's next and then he goes where are you at now I said five chord and he goes no let's make it a two five one I said what's what do you mean and he goes replace that whole bar of five with a, a bar of two minor and a bar of, of five dominant so he went And he probably showed me something that was like. Right? So he just played. And it was just a huge, like, again, light bulb thing. Where all he's doing is taking these things that I was playing already in rhythm mostly. And building them in between playing blues. Like a normal guy over the rest of the chords. And I became obsessed with that. So he told me you should you should take a piece of paper and write out 12 bars, so 12 slashes bars, and then fill them in with all those chords. Write it differently every time. So like maybe write So I started just writing 12 bar passages like that with chords on on every other beat at least and then i just sit there look at the piece of paper and try to hit those chords while i played by myself so i would just go And I would do that's 10 years of that. Yeah, I would just okay. did that constantly. And then it became harder songs with more changes and learning the actual things to play over those chords. So if a chord came up like that, to know that I could play, you know, uh, a different scale, like a lady and or whatever. That's, that's the stuff you learn over the years yeah. to play on each chord. But those core elements are still the things you use to get from one chord to the next. So like the two five one that you're saying, it doesn't just have to be in that place. Sure. I can take that and use that to get to the four. So I can go. So I played the two and the five of the chord that's oh, coming that's, next, uh, which yeah. is yeah. a Coltrane thing. It's that's those are all the devices that I use, and that's how I started. If you are confused at this point, uh, when Josh is using terms like two five one, two five and one relate to. The, the the scale the the chord tone of the song you're in so the key center is the one the two is the two minor so you gotta know your circle fifths but yeah you know it's it's basically the intervals in the given key that the song is in and when you said when you were playing um the melody parts and you were picking out the right notes in those chords those notes are one three five and seven I most guess. of that was just one three five and seven yeah mm -hmm. Because none of those chords were exotic chords, you yeah, know yeah. what I mean? So they're the notes that really define... Yes. But then you know, when the, then the chords start getting more complex, you got to know what to, yeah. what makes that chord that chord. So if a chord comes, if you get, even if it's just a major 7 chord, what I'm hearing in my head is... So I know I've got to play... So say it goes... We all know songs that do that, so I'm just... You know, it's 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 just highlighting the chord tones that make that chord yeah, that yeah, chord. Yeah. You know, what's so fascinating in all of this to to me anyway, and I, I Dan maybe less so because Dan actually did study jazz. But you were talking about the differences between jazz and rock. Yeah. When you're when you come into rock and roll guitar like the way probably most of us did, there was rhythm guitar and there was lead guitar. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. rhythm guitar was playing simple chords, and lead guitar was banging up and down scales. And actually, it's just guitar. 
and there are chords. Oh, yeah. And that's the way jazz guys learn, isn't it? They learn that there are chords and the melodies are within those chords. Absolutely. It's all the same th language, you yeah. know what I mean? It, the chords, it's, it's all part of this whole thing, you know, the soup of what you got to learn. And, you know, to, to be an improviser, you don't, I mean, most guys can go their entire life and play nothing but... And be unbelievable. Yeah, I, 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 I'll listen to Otis Rush do it all yeah. day long for the rest of my life and be thrilled. And Albert King, it's my favorite thing in the world. But that being said, it's like all this other stuff is available there, yeah, sure. right. you know, to, to do. And some of it is not quite as rocket science as people think it is, mm. really. I just want 10% of it. That'll do me. 1% oh, will do me, honestly. Okay. You know, it'd be really great. It'd be really great to hear... Josh, do this. Some this in context, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if we can find a rhythm guitar player. Or even just another guitar player. Another guitar, yes, yeah, so it's because there isn't such a thing as rhythm or lead guitar player. Hang on a sec. Oh, you're bringing your aerial out. Yeah, nice, nice, okay. Good chat. Okay, well listen. Let's um let's get out here. Let's get the uh Ariel let's get the Ariel slide wagon <laughs> set up. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Massive thank you to Josh for coming in today and also to Ariel. Thank you for stepping in.
Uh, yeah, thank you, man. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks for pulling me out. Our favourite bag boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's been he's been in there a long time, to be fair. So. <laughs> um, yeah, guys, thank you so much for watching. Uh, massive thank you to our preferred retailers uh, in the UK and Europe is. Uh, Additors Music of Guildford, sorry. In Australia is. Uh, Pedal Empire of Brisbane, uh, somewhere in Australia. And, and in the... US. Uh, Riff City of New Hope, Minnesota. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. And uh, don't forget to go to that pedal show, uh, that pedal show store.com and purchase one of your lovely Schwang garments. And uh, we're going to see if we get some trucker hats as well. Yeah, we so should. We so should. Yeah. We yeah, so yeah. should. Uh, brilliant. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.